in ordinary circumstances, I jump right to a practical demonstration and verification of the above properties using a real-world device. However, we yet to discuss how to start an electrically excited synchronous motor, which is a little more difficult than one might initially suspect. In contrast to squirrel cage induction motors, electrically excited synchronous motors are not self-starting motors and often necessitate more complicated starting circuits than would a similarly related induction motor. One of the principal issues related to starting a synchronous motor is that upon closure of a full voltage starter, the stator rotating magnetic field is instantaneously established at full speed, whereas the rotor in applied load with some level of static inertia may take some time to come up to this speed. The analogy I like to use about starting a synchronous motor is having your buddy invite you to go water skiing. And then he passes you on a dock at 60 miles per hour and then tosses your rope and saying, let's go. It's going to rip your balls right out of your sockets if you try to accelerate that fast. And there might be better ways to reach this velocity. An old school method of starting a large synchronous motor was to believe it or not, use other motors or mechanical means like a gas powered engine to accelerate and unload a rotor to near synchronous speeds before turning on the exciter. Once locked into the synchronous speed, the motor can be then put to work. Some electrically excited synchronous motors include a small accessory starting motor called a pony motor for this purpose. A more modern method might be to use a variable frequency drive to slowly ramp up excitation frequency on the stator so the rotor is afforded a gentle means of acceleration. You'll often find this method employed with permanent magnet synchronous motors since their rotor field isn't capable of being de-energized nor varied, as would an electrically excited synchronous motor. Finally, smaller electrically excited synchronous motors can often be operated as induction motors during the starting stage to accelerate the rotor to near synchronous speeds before turning on the exciter. This necessitates some modification of the rotor and that in addition to the field coil reserved for synchronous operation, the rotor needs to include a cage-like structure characteristic of an induction motor for the momentary starting phase. These are called amortisseur or damper windings. Bonus points if you can pronounce amortisseur properly as I've yet to do so myself. In summary, the desirable constant speed characteristics of synchronous motors come at a price of slightly more complicated, i.e. expensive means of construction, maintenance, starting, and protection. We'll examine electrically excited synchronous motors, exciters, starters, and protection schemes in later lectures. Today's lecture will restrict itself to the mechanical and electrical properties of an electrically excited synchronous motor in steady state operational conditions. Now that we've got the theory out of the way, let's do a practical demo and call it a day. All right, here's the plan. First, we're going to get the motor rotating, establish a specified field current, and then vary oppositional torque until it reaches pullout. Along the way, we'll record current, electrical, and mechanical power. Then we'll reset the system, get the motor rotating again, increase field current, and then vary oppositional torque until it again reaches pullout. Similarly, we'll record current, electrical, and mechanical power. Then we'll do it again and again until we've gained confirmation of the electrically excited synchronous motor properties or break something along the way, whichever comes first. Ultimately, we should be able to generate a bunch of plots showing electrical and mechanical properties as a function of load torque and field strength. Ideally, these real-world plots will closely match the theoretical expectations. For the purposes of this exercise, we're going to use a pretty rugged but admittedly inefficient quarter horsepower rated electrically excited synchronous motor designed to operate with 120 volts line to neutral, 280 volts line to line light industrial three phase AC in Y configuration. This particular motor has two pole pairs per phase, thus at 60 hertz, has a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM. Inside its operational range, i.e. under the pullout torque for a specified field current, we should expect the speed to remain at a constant 1800 RPM. An algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula demonstrates this motor rated condition of one quarter horsepower, 186.5 watts at 1800 RPM should generate roughly one newton meter of torque. This is the condition we'll concentrate most of our analysis on. The first of four repetitions shows that at a minimum excitation of 450 milliamperes of DC field current, we start at 0.3 newton meters of counter torque, which is just enough torque to overcome friction of the dynamometer we'll be using to put this machine through its paces. In this almost unloaded condition, the motor turns at 1800 RPM. As I progressively increase counter torque to 0.5 newton meters, 0.75 newton meters, 1 newton meters, 1.25 newton meters, and 1.5 newton meters, the motor remains spinning at a constant 1800 RPM. Inside this operational range, the speed of the electrically excited synchronous motor remains locked with the synchronous speed of the stator as we might expect. Inside this range, as torque increases, we observe a progressive increase in line current in blue, 
on real electrical power consumption in purple. As we'd expect, for such low levels of field excitation, the synchronous motor consumes positive reactive power in pink and current lags voltage as if it was an inductive load. Interestingly enough, reactive power remains relatively constant throughout the operational range, only increasing at the very, very end. Things go bad at 1.7 Newton meters. At such low levels of field current, the motor quickly reaches pullout torque and loses synchronization. Rotor speed dramatically drops, line current spikes, and the motor starts making sounds like it's being pulled through a knot hole backwards. Shut her down. No good can come of this. Let's do a second repetition of this with increased field current. When I step up excitation to 540 milliampers, we again start at 0.3 newton meters of counter torque. In this almost unloaded condition, the motor still turns at 1800 RPM. As I progressively increase counter torque to 0.5 newton meters, 0.75 newton meters, 1 newton meters, 1.25 newton meters, and 1.75 newton meters, the motor remains spinning at a constant 1800 RPM. Inside this operational range, the speed of the motor remains locked with the synchronous speed of the stator as we might expect. You note with increased field current, we exceeded the previous pullout torque value. As previously, inside this range, as torque increases, we observe a progressive increase in line current in blue and real electrical power consumption in purple. Something interesting is happening with reactive power with this level of increased field current. You'll note the synchronous motor still consumes positive reactive power in pink, however, not as much as previously. As before, reactive power remains relatively constant throughout the operational range, only increasing at the very end. With this level of increased field current, things start to go bad at two newton meters. As previously, the motor loses synchronization and line current spikes. Shut her down. All right, third rep. Let's do this again with increased field current. When I step up excitation current to 630 milliampers DC, we again start at 0.3 newton meters of counter torque. In this almost unloaded condition, the motor turns to 1800 RPM. As I progressively increase counter torque to 0.5 newton meters, 0.75, 1, 1.25, 1.5, 1.75 and 2 newton meters, the motor remains spinning at a constant 1800 RPM. Inside this operational range, the rotor remains locked with the synchronous speed of the stator as we might expect. You note with increased field current, we exceeded the previous pullout torque value. As previously inside this range, as torque increases, we observe a progressive increase in line current in blue and real electrical power consumption in purple. Something cool is happening to the reactive power with this level of increased field current. You'll note for a majority of this operational range, not only has reactive power consumption decreased, it's actually gone negative, i.e. supplying capacitive reactive power, only crossing into the positive inductive realm at the very end. This level of increased field current, things start to go bad at 2.25 newton meters. As previously, the motor loses synchronization and line current spikes. Shut her down. All right, last rep. Let's do this again with maximum field current. When a step up excitation is 720 milliampers DC, we again start at 0.3 newton meters of counter torque. In this almost unloaded condition, the motor turns at 1800 RPM. As I progressively increase counter torque to 0.5 newton meters, 0.75, 1, 1.25, 1 1.5, 1 1.75, 2, and 2.25 newton meters, the motor remains spinning at a constant 1800 RPM. Inside this operational range, the speed of the rotor remains locked with the synchronous speed of the stator, as we might expect. You note with increased field current, we exceeded all previous pullout torque values. This is as tough as this particular motor can get. As previously, inside this range, as torque increases, we observe a progressive increase in line current in blue and real electrical power consumption in purple. As previously, with this level of increased field current, for a majority of the operational range, reactive power has gone negative or capacitive only crossing into the positive or inductive realm at the very end. With field current pegging the limit, things start to go bad at 2.5 newton meters. As previously, the motor loses synchronization and line current spikes. Shut her down. Let's review what we just witnessed. First, pullout torque increased roughly linearly as we increased field current. At 450 milliampers, it lost synchronization at 1.75 newton meters. At 540 milliampers, it lost synchronization at 2 newton meters. At 630 milliampers, it lost synchronization at 2.25 newton meters. And finally, at 720 milliampers, it lost synchronization at 2.5 newton meters. Every time it lost synchronization, speed and torque dropped, line current spiked, and the motor started bucking and snorting like a Bronco choking on a stripper's scarf. 
This is obviously something to be avoided in regular operation and necessitates sophisticated out-of-step protection schemes we'll examine in greater detail in later lectures. If we kept on and on increasing field current beyond the manufacturer's recommendations to 900 milliampers or 1 amp or even 1.2 amps DC, we might expect only marginal increases in pullout torque with it eventually leveling out and flatlining due to saturation. Long story short, increased field current results in a stronger motor with an increased operational range. This being said, there are practical limits. Let's now discuss what we observe regarding line current, real, and reactive power. For all levels of field current excitation, we observe roughly linear increase in current and real power for increased levels of counter torque. Makes sense. More counter torque means more mechanical power, thus the motor draws more current and consumes more real electrical power. Something cool happens with reactive power at different levels of field current. At low levels of rotor excitation, the motor draws positive inductive reactive power. As we increase field current, the motor draws less and less positive inductive reactive power. As we continue to increase field current, at a certain point, the nature of reactive power flip-flops and the motor starts supplying negative or capacitive reactive power. Further increases push it well into negative territory. This confirms the theoretical plot of reactive power as a function of field current. At low levels of field excitation, the motor consumes positive reactive power. At high levels of field excitation, the motor supplies negative reactive power. This also implies there's a balance point in there that we skipped over that the motor should neither draw nor supply reactive power, and not only will current be in phase with voltage, but also achieve a minimum magnitude. This necessitates further inspection. It's kind of hard to see the details on these larger plots with all this data, so let's zoom into one condition, the rated condition of one newton meter, and show in real time how variations in field current affect line current magnitude and phase shift. Here I'm plotting voltage across and current through winding one in black on top. Voltage across and current through winding two in red in the middle, and voltage across and current through winding three in blue on bottom. At a minimum excitation of 450 milliampers, when I load the motor up to one newton meter of counter torque, i.e. the rated condition, current is clearly lagging voltage, as a magnitude of roughly 700 milliampers. Yes, current's a little distorted, but if you squint your eyes just right, you can see where the sine wave is. Remaining in the rated condition of one newton meter at 1800 RPM, when I increase excitation current to 540 milliampers, the phase shift between current and voltage decreases and line current magnitude drops to roughly 646 milliampers. Similarly, remaining in the rated condition of one newton meter at 1800 RPM, when I continue to increase excitation current to 630 milliampers, the phase shift between current and voltage continues to decrease, momentarily appears in phase, and starts to lead with a magnitude of roughly 638 milliampers. We'll come back to examine the in-phase condition in a moment. Finally, remaining in the rated condition of one newton meter at 1800 RPM, when I max out excitation current at 720 milliampers, the phase shift between voltage and current continues to increase in a leading fashion, and magnitude increases to roughly 663 milliampers. For those that missed it, let me describe what happened. As we progressively increased excitation current, not only did the lagging phase shift between voltage and line current decrease, become in phase, and start increasing a leading fashion, current magnitude decreased, reached some minimum value, and then started increasing. This confirms our earlier theoretical expectation that there's some value of field current at a given load condition, in this case the rate of condition of one newton meter at 1800 RPM, that the motor neither draws nor supplies reactive power, voltage and current are in phase with one another, a unity power factor, and current reaches some minimum value. Let's see if we can find that sweet spot. Let's just concentrate on winding one only and start from the beginning. Voltage across and current through winding one appears in black and dark gray. Power appears in, I guess, magenta. I don't know what color that is. At 450 milliampers of excitation current, line current clearly lags voltage. There are brief exchanges of reactive power above and below the horizontal axis. When I increase excitation current to 540 milliampers, the phase shift decreases and the exchanges of reactive power above and below the horizontal axis decrease in magnitude. When I increase excitation current to 630 milliampers, phase shift continues to decrease, becomes in phase, and starts to lead. Went a little too far. I'm going to dial it back to right about there. When I dial the field current back down to 600-ish milliampers, looks like voltage and current are perfectly in phase with one another, and current reaches a minimum value of roughly 620-ish milliampers. Long story short, by balancing field current for a given load condition, an electrically excited synchronous motor can power factor correct itself.
Pretty neat, huh? We'll examine how an unloaded synchronous motor, often referred to as a synchronous condenser, can power factor correct other loads in an upcoming lecture. Until then, that's all I got for you today. In conclusion, this lecture examined the construction and theory of operation of electrically excited synchronous motors, as well as examine their mechanical and electrical properties while in operation. Additionally, we examined how the field strength influences pullout torque and electrical performance at various load conditions. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.